everyone. Thank you for attending. It's a small room. Thank you for making yourself comfortable here. So I am Tapash Roy, and I have with me Austin. Um, we both work at Kaiser Permanente. This was one of the research areas that we thought is very interesting, along with predictive analytics. Um, I'm going to go through an outline of this thing. I'm going to talk about the motivation, the philosophy, provide you some definitions. Uh, this talk was supposed to be for a novice level, so I'm going to start with very basics. So some of you may be fairly advanced in this. I understand that. But um, we'll start with very basics. We'll go through a little complicated math. Austin is going to take us there. We'll go through some examples on the data sets that we have worked on. And we'll review our results and the next steps. Okay. So the motivation. Um, majority of the predictive analytics today is based on historic data. As data scientists, we gather data. We train the data using a variety of algorithms. We test it, validate it, and finally deploy our models. We, there might be a variety of ways of deployment, and we can have another discussion on model deployment strategies. Uh, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm taking a different angle. Um, we're talking about situations which are not trained, situations which we don't have historic data. How do we work with that? Classic example is the stock market. You come into a situation where you have not seen something happening. How do we model that? And that was the motivating question behind it. And this is the first step in the research area that we are doing. Certainly not the final. I don't have the answers yet. But this is the first step. And we have some data to prove that, OK, we are moving in the right direction. I'm going to start with philosophy. And I'm going to keep it uh, entertaining. So I'm going to ask you guys questions. OK, this is an easy question. Who said this? So far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And so far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. Anyone? Perfect. Perfect. Since you know this answer, I'm going to ask you a difficult one now. <laughs> as complexity rises, precise statements lose meaning, and meaningful statements lose precision. Now, this is Dr. Lotfi Zadeh. Um, he is one of the pioneers in fuzzy logic. He took the work from, he's from UC Berkeley, by the way. He took the work from Dr. Dempster and Sheffer, and then he extended it. He's written certain books on uncertainty reasoning as well. And uh, his work is, is very well respected in AI, especially kind of things. But good try. Thank you for trying. <laughs> I'm going to talk about very basic definitions, and I'm sure everybody is going to get this answer, but I still have to start somewhere. Um, I have a box. A box has 16 apples, 8 big, 8 small. I'm going to randomly pick an apple. There is uncertainty about the size of the apple that will come out. The size of the apple can only take two values. Can anybody tell me what's the probability that it's going to be a big apple? This is data science. <laughs> yeah, you saying something? It's fifty percent, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, oh, no, no tricks. It's it's uh, okay. So there are two distinct possible outcomes, and your random variable can take one of the two values, big or small. So there is this is randomness. This is uncertainty. Now we talk about fuzziness. Uh, now there is a box of 16 apples. These apples are of different sizes. And um, now I am asking you to take an apple in your hand, like this guy. And you are asked, what is, is this a big apple or a small apple? It's hard to quantify this, because it doesn't belong to a labeled size. And as data scientists, we do a lot of labeling. We do this very often. Uh, data we characterize into sets, basically. But this is fuzziness. So this is what we are talking about, the fuzzy area. And when Austin will, that will go into details about the math about it, he will show a, a, uncertainty, a certainty zone, which is the fuzzy area. Okay. I think everybody is on the same page now. Okay. So why did I select Dempster-Sheffer method? 
Um, a couple of things. Dempster Shepherd was used in AI a lot and in reliability modeling. And I have some links, and there is a whole list of references. You can reach out to me later on. I can give you the details on the references as well. Um, it led to the path of fuzzy logic. I wanted to go to the basic algorithms of dempster Sheffer and see how I could integrate it with our regular predictive modeling algorithm. And thanks to my interns who did work with me and spent days and nights on it. Without them, I would not have validated a few of them. Um, so that was the basic principle why I wanted to go behind dempster Sheffer. So also, dempster Sheffer is um, generalization of Bayesian theory of subjective probabilities. Um, are there any frequent tests in this room? Or everybody's Bayesian here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So Bayesian theory, I mean, uh, requires probability for each question um, of interest. However, using dempster Sheffer theory, I can get degrees of belief. And degrees of belief is strength of evidence in favor of some proposition. I take it for one question, and I can use it for a related question. So I take my knowledge for one question, and I send it for a related question. And I put some links down there for people to use it, or look at it later on. So that was why dempster Sheffer. And I'm going to give you a brief history about dempster Sheffer before we jump into the actual math and details about it. So it has its roots in 17th century in some form. People were talking about it. Uh, 1968, Dr. Dempster at Harvard actually came up with a way of combining beliefs. 76, the dempster Shepherd theory was created. I understand it's before the majority of people here were born. Um, but this theory was actually criticized a lot um, because it was combining probabilities of truth with probabilities of probability. Um, so that was criticism on it, and we didn't see much work. But last few years, there have been more and more researchers talking about it, talking about how to use this and stuff like that. Uh, especially the last two papers were pretty good about what dempster Sheffer can do and how can we combine evidence. We are reaching a stage where we have enough data to now model uncertainty to some extent. There's still a lot of room to cover here. OK, I'm going to take talk about some basic examples. Um, and then we are going to go to the math. So dempster Shepherd theory has two components. One is obtaining degrees of belief and combining the degrees of belief. Um, and I'll explain you what is the degree of belief again. So let's start with a story. I have a friend, Betty. I think she's pretty much reliable. She's 90% of the time is reliable. So, I give subjective probabilities to her, 90%, 0.9. She's unreliable, 10%, 0.1. She calls me and she tells me, hey, a limb fell on your car. She's a reliable friend, so there is no reason for me to worry about why would she say that. Or So I take her testimony alone and say that I give you a 0.9 degree of belief that a limb fell on my car based on the subjective probability, and a zero belief that no limb fell on my car. In this case, the belief functions is between 0, 0.9 and 0. Um, perfect. So the 0 degree of belief here does not mean that I am sure that no limb fell on my car. It merely means that based on Betty's testimony, I have no reason to believe that a limb fell on my car. And this is the part where it was criticized, because now you are giving probability instead of probabilities of truth, the degree function. You're giving, so you have subjective probabilities, 0.9 and 0.1. But my degree, belief function, the strength of evidence is 0.9. And zero degree of belief. For me, there is no reason to disbelieve. Yeah, I just use her statements. I don't use the actual events. Perfect. Now let's have more fun. So I have another friend named Sally. Sally is also a reliable friend. She's reliable 90% of the times and unreliable 10% of the times. She, independent of Betty, comes and tells me, hey, a limb fell on my car. So 
there are two people saying the same thing. And I'll just do the probability math and keep it easy here. Is uh, both are probability that both are reliable is 0.9 into 0.9 is 0.81. Probability neither of them is reliable is 0.01. And probability that at least one is reliable is 0.099. So this is basic at least one probability. Since both said a limb fell on my car, at least one of them being reliable, I say that this event has a degree of belief of 0.99 based on the least one. Okay? So this is a scenario where they both agree with each other. And now I'm going to the next scenario where they both contradict each other. Okay. Sally contradicts Betty. Sally tells me that no limb fell on my car. So in this case, both of them cannot be reliable because one has to be unreliable. So now we go into something called as prior versus posterior probabilities. Anybody, everybody knows what's a prior? So if for some people who don't know what's a prior is uh, existing state, if you are a computer scientist, it's the state zero and then you go to state one, it's like a state diagram. So think of it that way. So prior is the existing state. So Betty is reliable, Sally is not. We multiply the probabilities, it's straightforward. Sally is reliable, Betty is not. We multiply the probabilities, straightforward. Neither of them are reliable, it's easy. Now we go to a posterior state. The posterior state is a state where provided at least one is reliable. So the probability that Betty is reliable and Sally is not, divided by the probability that at least one is reliable, unreliable, we get nine by 19. And we do the same thing for Sally, we get nine by 19. So we have nine by 19 degree of belief that a limb fell on my car, Betty is reliable, and nine by 19 degree of belief that no limb fell on my car and Sally is reliable. So this is my belief function area. Uh, we can go through the math if you have questions. I can sit with you. I can show you what we did. And we can give you the references from this where this was as well. So what, what we are trying to show here is we obtained degrees of belief for one question. Did a limb fell on my car from the probabilities of another question? Is the witness reliable? Okay. So just we have moved something. and. Um, this is the basic example Dr. Dempster actually gave in his class in 2001. Uh, what we will do now, Austin will basically take us to the math, and then he will take us to uh, the examples that we simulated and show us the results. Okay, Austin, you want to go next? Okay, I need to give you this. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm going to go into the, you know, kind of where we're going with this whole project. That was kind of, um, Deboche did a great job of laying the groundwork for it. Um, so whenever, you know, you start on some kind of obscure project, it's kind of nice to know, like, what your objectives are in the first place. Um, and so really kind of the main uh, motivation in case um, it wasn't obvious already is just we're trying to find like a fuzziness to prediction so if you have some sort of probability um, you know make, you make some probability statement like um, there's a 0.5 or something like that um, probability of something happening um, and if, for example in logistic regression you can produce probabilities um, but what it can't do is um, maybe provide some like interval for uncertainty for those probabilities um, so Maybe an example of how that might be useful, um, I was thinking about, is possibly if you have, um, you know, a lot of times you'll have a cutoff of 0.5 where you would classify um, for a binary prediction either one class or the other. So if you had, say, a, a 0.49 um, probability for one observation, for example, um, perhaps if you had some uncertainty around that probability, it might cover your um, boundary line where you're going to classify it. Um, as say zero or one. So that's kind of what we're going for. And then since it is kind of um, this unexplored territory a little bit, um, we'd like to see if it actually does any better than um, the logistic regression, which uh, is, I should point out, our, we're using as our, our prior 
um, that Tapash introduced you. So what we're doing is we're taking um, right now logistic regression as our, our prior information, um, but it, another algorithm could be used. There's, there's nothing that tied us to that other than it's just kind of, you know, the first thing you go to because it's so fast, quick, and easy. Um, so these are kind of the proof or, you know, what we've kind of validated that we're on the right track so far. These are the different data sets are, I'm sure some of you have seen them before. Um, most of them are from UCI Machine Learning Data Repository. For sure everyone's familiar with that. Um, some of them are kind of weird, but, um, you know, it's basically, uh, we just, we're looking for a binary um, response variable that we wanted to test on. Uh, so just kind of, you know, maybe just a, a high level overview of, of uh, the trends we've seen so far. We've done some like statistical validation, um, but, you know, there's just so many different, um, you know, things to do basically when you're trying to create this kind of new thing that, um, you know, we're still working on validating it. Um, it, does, it does increase some performance metrics that we've tested. Um, one thing we have on our list is to add more a comprehensive list of different metrics just so we can be um, rigorous on our testing. Um, uh, and, and so the algorithm is, is not black box. Um, you know, if you understood the examples Taposh gave you, I think they're um, fairly straightforward, then that's, um, that's kind of what you need to know f as far as um, the algorithm. We're just doing kind of a few little um, things that are different, which I'll go over. As I mentioned before, the prior probabilities can come from other algorithms other than logistic regression, uh, which is kind of cool. And there's, um, we're even thinking possibly multi uh, bring in multiple uh, prior algorithms. Going forward, we want to see how it scales. So, you know, um, are we going to actually get any, you know, tangible um, results from this um, if we wanted to scale it up? Um, the dimster schaefer um, basically it emphasizes agreement. So in the case of um, the two friends when a limb fell in the car, you know, it, it wants to emphasize, um, you know, where they agree on certain issues on whether a limb fell into Pasha's car or not. Um, so if you have highly imbalanced classes, sometimes it'll look for too much agreement when maybe there isn't that much of agreement. Um, and then we do want to test uh, different prior algorithms. So anyone's taken a probability class, we're kind of in a data science atmosphere, so I'm pretty sure you've taken one. I'm pretty sure you've taken or done sort of problem with marbles in a jar, or um, I think they still use the term urn. Um, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna say, instead of taking uh, a marble out of the urn, you know, what's the probability of getting red or blue marble? We're gonna turn that to a, a binary situation and just say what's the majority of, of colors in the jar. So let's say I picked um, one of you out of the audience and I asked you, what do you think the majority is? Um, let's assume there's more marbles than there is now, but um, you would maybe, I would guess, give him some sort of answer like, I think probably red or I think probably blue. Maybe I could push you a little further and I could give you kind of, get you to give me your degree of belief. So, you know, maybe quantify your belief a little bit more. And let's say I picked two people out of the audience and I wanted to kind of merge that information a little bit, then ideally I would get um, more informed opinion on what the majority of colors in the jar is. So let's say I did that. Um, let's say the first person, the conversation went something like the majority of colors in the jar is red, and they're able to quantify that at 70%. Maybe you think there's half-half, and there's a 10% or 10 degree belief of that, and then um, let's say that they're willing to quantify that they're actually wrong in this case, you could say, um, and that's at 20%. And I go to person two, person two is not quite so sure. They say 50% uh, a majority being red. And I just want to point out it's a little interesting because if you have like two kind of outcomes, you know, if you say 50% chance of one happening, then you normally say, okay, well, 50-50 either way. But um, with this kind of fuzzy logic idea, Technically, person two could only give me an answer of 50%, and then um, as to Posh's example, where the, there's that zero someone asked about, um, they can just kind of leave the rest on the set. But let's say they did fill in the rest of that 100%, and they said half uh, blue-red, uh, that 20%, and then um, that they were wrong at 30%. So one initial guess, if you were just talking to these people and you say, okay, well, it seems like the majority is red, maybe you would average the two majorities from those two people and, and you'd come out at like 60%, right? 
um, but Dempster Schaefer actually finds that agreement, so we get a much larger degree, a final degree of belief for the majority of colors in that jar being red. And it, it looks, you can kind of see it kind of steals, I guess you could say, some of the degree of belief from um, that half-half situation because we don't have that much agreement. So it's kind of penalizing a little bit the disagreement between those two people. So I just want to give that example. I'll try and refer back to it as I go to um, the math part a little bit. I'm not going to really go into much detail, but basically um, this, uh, this stuff right here, that's kind of where we are merging our two beliefs. And in order to do that, um, so A is, for example, the majority of colors in the jar is red. Um, and then B and C are just some other um, propositions that we have. So um, we're kind of, you know, multiplying together, kind of like Deposh did a little bit. And then we're kind of adding them all together to get one final kind of merged belief. And then we're kind of, you can say, normalizing a little bit by this um, one minus a degree of conflict. So we're kind of normalizing by um, some sort of agreement. So again, emphasizing agreement between different um, sources of information. K is the uh, measure of conflict. I and mean, if you want to ask questions about it too, we can. Uh, yeah, you could kind of say that. Um, it's it's a little simpler when when there's like a binary case. Um, and one of the other areas that we might want to take this is extending it to a, a multi-class case, which gets much more complicated because. Uh, so in terms of like the marble example, um, we're thinking about what the majority of colors is. Um, so if we have like a majority of colors being red, the similarities are where um, we have the some subspace basically of, of some hypothesis. Is that, am I getting? Uh, it, it gets. Yeah, we will explain you that. I think we're going to yeah. come up with a modified algorithm now, and then there are some open things, and one of them is that. But I think the stuff is off time on that. Yeah. Can you also like, maybe a quick summary of like when K could become one? Is there a double limit? Uh. And there's zero Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, this part is like nothing especially new. I'm, Tapash went over the history about it, so there's, and we have references too that are, are pretty good to go over. Um, and while we're on just kind of the, you know, the main Dempster Schaefer stuff, really what we wanted to focus on is um, that interval. So there's the uncertainty Tapash mentioned, um, and just defining what, what, what is a belief, um, and a good way to think about it is just the strength of evidence in favor of some proposition. So if we want to find out um, what is the proposition for majority of colors of marble in a jar, um, that's going to be our belief. So kind of what it sounds like. Plausibility is something we haven't talked about, but that's important because you know if you have a certain belief of, of colors in a jar, um, in order to get that uncertainty, we kind of have to acknowledge that there's um, events, I guess you could say, that, that we're not considering. So that's that, um, that range that we're really kind of interested in for um, probabilities that are coming out. And then belief in um, the complement of A, so that's, again, kind of the situation where uh, did the branch fall on the car, did it not? If they only say the branch fell on a car and they leave the rest unsaid, then um, we don't necessarily have um, that conflict, or the complement, sorry. Uh, again, kind of going fairly quickly through this. This is the where we come, go from being Dempster Schaefer to a modified Dempster Schaefer um, with uh, the use of prior information. Um, in evidence space, um, again, it's ongoing research, but um, possibly using source, different sources of um, prior algorithms. But essentially what we're doing f to get that um, updated, so again, we're taking um, a prior probability, which in this case is represented by 
um, P of A, so A being, for example, the majority of colors in, in the jar are, are red, and then um, we're normalizing that over all the other different um, propositions that we're considering. So uh, what does that actually look like? Back to the marbles again. What's the majority of colors? We have the same two people. If we um, take in now, instead of just doing regular denser Schaefer, we take in um, a modified denser Schaefer, um, you notice that the uh, strength of belief for the majority of colors in the jar being red has, has gone up. So it would be, um, I think, a fair assumption to guess without knowing anything else that the prior information you had was in favor of the majority of colors in the jar being red. Um, and in fact, that's true for the calculation for um, for these particular numbers because, uh, so actually maybe a, a real life example that I thought of for this particular case was maybe you knew beforehand that the manufacturer of marbles um, makes, you know, a ratio of three to two red marbles. Um, so it'd be information going into uh, whatever um, belief you want to have um, about this particular problem. So this is kind of the framework of our algorithm. Basically, um, of course, we have a training and test set. Um, the only thing that we're taking from our training set is what our logistic regression algorithm, the probabilities that came out of that. So again, it doesn't have to be logistic regression. It could be some other algorithm. Um, and that's going into the modified part. Um, so where it gets a little more um, complicated than the examples we've gone over so far is that uh, we don't have like a panel of people kind of saying for each optimization what they think their strength of belief is. Um, and so our, our features are basically our, our people. So we need to get those measures of belief from individual people. And in order to do that, we have to artificially create them. I'll go over kind of how we do that in uh, the next slide. But we're essentially partitioning um, each feature based on min and max values. So after we bring in um, the prior algorithm, the prior probabilities for, um, from the training set, becomes modified with prior probabilities. We do some incorporating hypothesis stuff, which you don't really have to worry about the technical part. But basically, we're, um, that interval that I showed you before, uh, we're trying to just um, bring in that information about what the algorithm is saying uh, it believes, in addition to the uncertainty, and penalize um, the probabilities based on how much belief there is in, in one observation or, or um, disbelief. And then we reclassify the data with updated probabilities. Um, so this is kind of how we artificially create those math values. So for um, a given feature or a column, um, we have uh, three different situations. This is one of them. Uh, we partition each um, data by class. So if you, know, you just want to say zero and ones, it's a binary. In this situation, we have um, the class zero eclipsing the class one, so that's one situation. And then depending on which region each observation falls to, we're going to assign it um, a mass value, um, belief, disbelief, and um, in certain cases, uh, uncertainty. So now on to kind of what we've actually done so far. We've um, tested it so far on 43 data sets, mostly from UCI machine learning repository. And then there's also an R package called data sets um, and then uh, also not listed here is um, played around a little bit with uh, Higgs boson data set. Uh, so email spam, is it spam or is it not spam? I think um, the way it worked for this particular data set is a bunch of people sent in their um, spam to um, uh, a curator and basically um, telling that person if it was spam or not spam. So we have 4,600 authorizations for, which for the data sets that we tested on was kind of on the large side, granted it isn't really that large, but um, I think it does have quite a few features on it. Um, and if you think of that in terms of kind of what the Dempster Schaefer is trying to do where we're merging um, and trying to strengthen belief in a certain proposition, um, more features is better because you have kind of more overlapping um, potential evidence. Um, so for this particular data set, we did pretty well. And what I'm trying to show you is not necessarily like our algorithm is like, wow, it's doing awesome and everything. Um, I'm just trying to kind of highlight the feeling that we've gotten so far from the data sets, because um, we've only done some statistical testing, so it's not like um, fully rigorous or anything. But in this particular case, uh, it's, it's fairly representative of what we've seen. You know, we did better in accuracy. 
um, a lot of times when there's, there's absolutely no change at all between um, what we're comparing to, which is the LR logistic regression um, as compared to our algorithm, which is the logistic regression, Dempster Schaefer. Um, so it, it tends to do um, better on true positives, uh, worse on false positives. Um, for kind of evaluation over um, different values, we chose to use uh, PR curves. Um, so basically the takeaway from this picture is that uh, light blue is better than dark blue. Um, so they're, again, they're really similar, but um, our, our um, I just realized the title was wrong, but that's okay. Um, our PR curves are, um, are better for our logistic regression, not a, by a whole bunch, but um, significantly so. So an example I want to show you guys is um, from a cardiac single proton emission computed tomography images. Um, and we're predicting on basically where there is a normal or abnormal heart. And the interesting thing about this data set actually is uh, it's entirely binary. So um, I guess the way it worked is uh, a bunch of different people were shown different images and they said, you know, of different parts of the brain and they basically said, um, is it abnormal looking them or not? And then, um, so we have 23, I think, uh, different people looking at these different images. And then um, our response is, um, you know, finally is it, uh, are we looking at an abnormal heart or not? So that's our response. Um, this one had a much smaller um, observations. And I think from a theoretical side, this algorithm, uh, it maybe doesn't matter so much on actually the size of the data set because we're, we're not taking too much information you know, it's not like a tree where you, you kind of build your tree and then you apply it to some new data set. We're not actually taking too much information from our training data set, it's just those prior probabilities. Um, so it may not change is kind of how it's looking now. Again, it's, it's under research, but it may not change too much um, for scaling to up. Uh, and then um, this was one of the better examples um, where we uh, pretty much exceeded um, in every metric that we tested except for the false positives. The only reason I'm showing you this one is because uh, you, there's really no noticeable difference between the two PR curves, which is kind of interesting given that it's, um, you know, it was doing so much better in the different metrics. But I just wanted to show you this one because um, it, it, to me it just showed that, um, you know, it's not just kind of a random fluke that we're getting, we're getting really consistently high performance in our different metrics that we're testing. They're actually all above um, that diagonal line. So anything above the line is in favor of our algorithm and anything below the line. And for the, the AUC, it was actually exactly the same. Um, and here's our references. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but um, that's basically uh, all we had for you today.
algorithm methods remains the same. You can use all your algorithms. You can use deep learning, like you both get good results. I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to add a certain uncertainty. So think of scenarios where you have a score. And that the types of, I, when I started this talk, I talked about uh, randomness and fuzzy. What we are modeling with our standard machine learning methods is a randomness part. And it's just there. What I'm adding is a fuzzy edge. Right, so you could make models take away. You know, the neighbors would be certain. Okay. And yeah. Your So yeah, I'm still not there. That's a good question. If you're asking me that, have you modeled all the uncertainty possible, yeah, I'm still not there. No, I mean, it's just, it's just okay. I mean, yeah. that's where you're trying to go? We're trying to see that what happens. I mean, it probably will go towards an area where if a new situation is posted, we will be able to give some kind of belief that, okay, this new situation I'm not aware of. So if you take action for that situation, you'll have to, a human has to change before you take an action, not just follow the number, the score. So that, that's the area, that's the motivation behind. Publishing this first paper on this as well. So we'll let you know how that goes. 